So John, your research is in uh, feed efficiency in cattle. Yes, yep. Do we still have great leaps to be made in that area? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, really, we haven't made many. From a genetics point of view, we've made no improvements in uh, efficiency of feed util utilization. As a matter of fact, there's some people who think that we've gone backwards. So there are some major steps to be taken. And uh, over the last 10 years, we've been working with a feed efficiency trait that's different than we have traditionally used. We're also using genomic technology to help speed that our way along in that regard. Hold on, how can we be going backwards? Well, how, you, how that happens is that uh, through the selection for average daily gain in our feedlot cattle, we've actually ended up with a bigger cow that has higher maintenance requirements. So our feed efficiency, from a genetics point of view, has gone backwards. There is, it takes more feed to keep an, a cow now for the same weight and body condition score than it did, you know, 50 years ago. So, so really what's happened is, is that, I guess the least we can say, is we've made very little progress. And we're hoping with our new traits that we're looking at in, in, uh, in beef cattle, and one is called residual feed intake. And really what that is, is it's feed intake adjusted for any differences in growth rate and body size. And so, the, so it becomes independent of body size and growth rate and is more related to maintenance requirement of the individual animal. So are, are we gonna, do you think that we're gonna have uh, advances in the way we select our animals? Or mm -hmm. is it just, we're looking, it's almost like money ball. We're looking at different data. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, no, actually we will have different traits and we already do. Um, innovative uh, cattle breeders in Alberta and throughout the world are actually going after uh, residual feed intake in their young breeding stock and are actually using it to select animals, bulls, and, and young breeding animals that have lower maintenance requirements. So you can imagine, if I have lower maintenance requirements, means I have less, more energy left over for production. That means growth, milk production, putting body fat on, putting energy into the newborn calf, that, those kinds of things, right? Certain breeds lend, do they, um, certain breeds lend themselves to this? Um, so breed differences, are quite minor. There are differences. Some breeds are more efficient than others. Usually breeds that are selected for milk production tend to be less efficient. Less, they have higher maintenance requirements. And that's because they produce more milk and they've got more uh, rumen uh, size and, and internal viscera size. And so that just leads to uh, you know, more energy required just for maintenance. So there are those general differences. But within any breed or crossbred or hybrid, you will find huge differences in feed efficiency. And that's not surprising because if I said at the beginning very little changes have been made in, in, in maintenance requirements, then you would expect that feed efficiency would be easily improved in all breeds. And it is true. We see huge differences within animals in all breeds. So are you mainly focused on, on uh cattle on grass or are you focused also on cattle in a feed yard or both? Uh, both, both and, and uh, that's really interesting. So our first part of our, let's say first five or six years of our research and that of many other people throughout the world were around how does this translate to the feeder cattle because that's easy to do. It translates really nicely so if you pick a, a bull that's feed efficient with the traits that we're saying, you will end up within one generation uh, progeny, steer and heifer progeny in the feedlot that will save you money. Okay, now we're working on the female side and over the next five or six years we're going to look at what it does to the cow and there are some very prominent, uh, very exciting things that are happening there and I'm going to be talking about those in my presentation. So I'm not going to tell you about them now, but... but <laughs> well, this it, is going to yeah, be posted yeah, after. Yeah, so. <laughs> yeah, so, but some very interesting things. The other thing about this is that when you select for feed efficiency, true feed efficiency, you reduce the amount of nutrients that are spewed out into the environment by the cow. So what happens is your greenhouse gas footprint from these cattle decreases. So less methane, more friendly, lower carbon footprint. So that's, a, that's another very uh, interesting and useful uh, observation. So when we talk bottom line, what, what, is, what are some of the potential gains here yeah. from, a, from a rancher or, yeah. or a feed yard owner? Yeah, so bottom line, we think that within one or two generations of selecting for residual feed intake, it will mean about 
we would say 10 to 30 million dollars for the feeder, feeder cattle industry if it was adopted 100%. Of course, you know nothing is adopted 100%. To the cow herd, if we think that things are going to happen the same way that they did in the, with feeder cattle, that could mean between 30 and $50 million to the beef industry just in Alberta. Never mind Canada, never mind the rest of the world. So, so it has a huge uh, effect on cost of production. It reduces feed costs. So if uh, any producers want more information on some of the research that you're working on, where can they find it? Yeah, if they want, they can uh, go to uh, websites. Alberta Agriculture has a website, uh, Roping the Web. You probably are familiar with it. Or they can actually send me an email. Okay.